Welcome to the Raw Coding YouTube channel everybody, my name is Anton and today we're going to be doing a little bit of metaprogramming. If you watch my videos, you know I love metaprogramming, I have made a bunch of content on it and today perhaps we're going to be doing something a little bit forbidden. We're going to be touching JavaScript and we're going to be putting it in our ASP.NET Core application. There will be people who tell you it's a bad idea and I tell you, fuck them. We're professionals over here, we know what we're doing. Most of the amazing libraries out there that you use and most of computer programs will have an element of metaprogramming. So it's important to know this stuff. The area of metaprogramming that we're going to be dwelling in today is the idea that another computer somewhere over there is capable of doing something that your computer cannot do. Examples here range from the computer over there has a graphics card or perhaps it is a printer. So we would be sending something like Postscript to a printer for it to execute it. The specific scenario that we will be covering is the computer somewhere over there is going to contain an enormous amount of data and we're gonna process it over there rather than downloading tons of data and then doing the processing locally. If you ever process tons of data in the cloud, you know that bandwidth costs will eventually rack up. So grab yourself a cup of tea, relax, check out the description, the C-sharp course, man, you know what you're doing. Here we have two applications. We're gonna be using a package called Jint, and this is essentially a JavaScript interpreter. First of all, we're gonna have light steps towards our solution. We have an endpoint where we're getting entries from a database. The database is just a collection, right? So it's a makeshift database and we have a record of animals about as simple as an application can get. Let's go ahead, put this up. So dot watch. And here are the results, a bunch of animals. Now we're going to go through a little bit of a hello world example. The idea here is that we want to query this data or mutate this data or perform some kind of work on this data, but on the server side. So first of all, let's just ensure that we can execute some JavaScript on the server side. What we want to do is spin up an engine instance, and this comes from the Gent library. So var engine. We can then use this engine to evaluate some JavaScript. So evaluate, we're just gonna grab an array, like one, two, three, super simple, nothing too complicated. Let the application restart. We're gonna come back over here. I'm gonna refresh and I'm gonna get a bunch of types because I haven't called to object on the returning value, right? So evaluate will give me back JS value, which is a container or whatever is happening in the engine to object will give me the object which can then be serialized to a JavaScript array. So uh, let the server restart and there we have it. Now, this is JavaScript that was essentially evaluated over here one-to-one, -one, although yeah, this is JSON, but they're effectively the same. If I come back to the browser and I open up the console and I type in one, two, three over here, this interpreter inside the browser is effectively the same as the interpreter on the backend. So what we want to do is take the JavaScript that we're writing here, we will encode URI component, and we're just going to pass it here. We then want to take this JavaScript and send it to the server. So let's accept a string parameter of script. We'll then replace this array with script, come back to the browser, and then supply a script and pass our encoded data. And the result is exactly the same. If I take this three over here and replace it with five, we're gonna see one to five. So JavaScript is now being dynamically executed. Instead of just executing this JavaScript over here, let's take the engine and we will set a value. The specific value that we're going to set is data. And we are going to assign DB to that data. If I now come back over here, instead of this encoded thing, and there will be probably be spoiler alerts, I don't want this whole thing yet. I will just want the data to illustrate that I'm capable of interacting with the database through this data variable. Now, the other thing that I have typed out over here, I will just retype it through here. If I have encode URI component and I'm saying I want data and then I will map a Lambda function to it, but I actually want the original object. So I will just spread it in here. And then I will want the name length parameter and I will assign x name dot 
length and here is the whole program that I essentially want to execute on the server side. Let me copy it. I'm going to assign it over here. Enter. I'm going to get an exception first because the database as an object, the type that gets registered engine doesn't really know anything about the database. So let's actually convert this to an array. We'll come back. And as this is refreshed, we can see that the application that we have managed to execute on the back end against this data now gives us the possibility to do whatever we want because we are essentially executing JavaScript. So we can have a programmable backend and it can perform whatever work we want. As I said, this comes in handy if you have a computer somewhere else that has something that you don't have. And if you want to reach that something or work with that something without actually giving it away, you accept a program that can do some computation on it. If we close this program CS, we then go to the bench and I'm going to give you an example of how this may work. We set up a connection to the database. After we build their application, we spin up the database and we seed it with a million animals. I'm using bogus over here to fill out the properties automatically. We then fetch stuff from the client and the client endpoint here just gets everything from the database and the evaluation will happen in the browser. For the server side, we accept a script and the evaluation happens on the server side. Please note, we are passing along a million entities. You can chunk this up, you can do pagination, you can do many requests instead of one request. There are tons of variations that you can do for both of these endpoints. The thing that we're going to focus on is the sheer volume reduction that we can achieve and potential speed increase as well. With that, uh, let's go ahead and stop this application. I'm going to open up Bench and I'm going to start this. So .NET run. With the application now running, uh, let's open up uh, server side and actually duplicate this. And I'm going to open up client side besides this. So client side in the console and let me actually point to these two pages. We'll take a look at them before I start them. Uh, client side is going to just execute a function as soon as the page opens. It's going to fetch the data and then it's going to take this work and perform this work on the data. Server side, same thing. As soon as the page opens, we execute the JavaScript. Instead of evaluating this work after the fetch, we say what work we want to do and we send it to the back end. So the work gets performed on the back end. And then we just basically time it in both of these and we also output the results. Okay, so that is what is happening in both situations. Let's go to the network tab or client side. I'm going to give it a refresh here. We're going to see that the total operation of initiating the function and downloading took 3.8 seconds and we have managed to download 102 megabytes. A big note here is that we are on local network and it's very fast, right? It's not going over any wire. It's all in memory. If we go to the server side over here and I'll refresh, hopefully you haven't spoiled anything for yourself there. The execution here takes 4.6 seconds and the download size is actually 1.2 kilobytes. I'm not going to be able to do the math on how or what's the percentage size difference between the two, but it's pretty big. But the main point here is that the server side is actually slower than the client side. Why is that? Well, I did say that it's a local network and there isn't actually any bandwidth. So what we're going to do is we're going to enable throttling of fast internet. And one point on this, how fast is it? This is 100 megabits per second. My internet at home is slower than this. Okay. I live in UK, third world country. No good internet here. Okay. This is not Sweden. I tried setting this up to one gigabit per second, but this makes uh, Google Chrome for some reason an unstable and some of the requests are just failing. So this is the most stable setup. And if we want the one gigabit result, I'll just tell you that it was basically just twice as fast as this one. Here you can see that the download is being performed a lot slower. And even though you're going to be in the cloud, the download speeds are going to vary. Here you can see the request has just failed. So I'm just going to restart this. I, I don't know why it's failing. I'm just going to keep refreshing this until it actually succeeds. I think it's a problem with the browser. There we have a successful response. Uh, this has taken 13.8 seconds. And if we still keep our uh, network throttling, but right over here, so fast internet, 
or server side and we give it a refresh, you can expect that the speed as isn't actually going to change all that much. So 4.5 seconds. So this stays consistent. And if you perform optimizations on the back end, you're actually going to get improvement in this specific number. So the load is on your server side and on the computer that is actually holding the valuable thing rather than you giving away the valuable thing or having to transport that valuable thing or just playing not being able to transport it because that other computer is a printer and you can't download a printer into your computer, right? So that's just impossible. But hopefully uh, this scenario illustrates this clearly that if you have tons of data, which generally companies these days do, if you have these constraints of bandwidth, so let's say you don't have 100 gigabytes per second or something like that, but also if you have that kind of speed, if you're transferring tons and tons of data constantly, it's actually going to cost you money. Egress and ingress in the cloud costs money. If you can avoid sending all of that data and just sending a small application that is going to perform work on that data and give you the final result, that is way more preferable than having to download all of that data, doing the work, and then throwing away all of that data and keeping the results of the work there is a big chunk of data transfer that you can actually just cut out from the whole thing if you understand metaprogramming, if you're capable of sending something like JavaScript to your backend. And by the way, let me show you, if you actually want to avoid having JavaScript over here, because this is the easy option. If you want to, you can actually send C sharp or you can have some kind of custom query language and what you would have to do is you would have to transform it into expressions. So you would have something like where, and even then you would not be able to perform work as part of an SQL query or something like that, as you would be able to do with JavaScript. Of course, you can build up your expression, compile it and invoke it like a Lambda function on the results of this data and then perform that work. So you're not restricted by JavaScript. You can do this natively in C sharp. I think that might actually be a little bit slower than this option, although I haven't tried. You can also have a WASM interpreter and instead of sending JavaScript, you send a WASM application. So there are tons and tons of options available to you. With that, I'm going to wrap up. As always, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe. If you have any questions, make sure to leave them in the comment section. If you would like the source code for this video as well as my other videos, please come support me on Patreon. I will really appreciate it. A very big and special thank you to all of my current Patreon supporters. You helped me do this work. As always, thank you for watching. I'll see you later.